Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Well, now, this is George Washington University, which I found when I came to the Dean Search last year is truly a warm community. So we're going to try this again. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Now, that is a GW greeting. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Blake Morant, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Law School, and it is certainly a pleasure for me to welcome you to this summit today. Um, I will tell you that in doing this, this truly does fulfill a big goal of mine. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that after I introduce the special individual who's going to get us started today. But one of the big goals was, of course, the subject matter of what we're talking about today, which is on the tip of the tongues of many individuals, both those who are in higher education, as well as individuals who are considering going to higher education, and also to the many people out there that are looking at higher education in terms of its continued uh, value and what have you. But the other thing that this really <laughs> excites me about is that every single dean that I know of, particularly law dean, love to have the opportunity to pretend to be Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> this is my Oprah Winfrey moment, and you'll be able to see that during the course of our time today. I want to tell you, you're in for a real treat. The individuals who are going to be introduced to you today are wonderful individuals, not only in terms of their experience, but also in terms of the vitality and the various things that they bring to the subject matter. But the first thing I want to do is introduce to you an individual that I've gotten the chance to really know very well in my time here at GW. Certainly, I met him when I came, became dean of this law school and have since worked with him in a way that really assures the true value and future of this institution. When I decided to do this event, of course, this has uh, the leaders of a variety of different and wonderful institutions. And, and we could not do this event without having the leadership of the George Washington University. And certainly, we do have a great one in Stephen Knapp. He is our 16th president of George Washington University. And as I looked at the array of things that he's done over the course of his, his career, it truly does indicate that not only are we at George Washington very fortunate to have such an <laughs> experienced and visionary leader, but also this is an individual who captures the very essence of what quality higher education is. His presidency began at GW University in August of 2007 after he had an illustrious career at two wonderful institutions, one, Johns Hopkins University, and also the University of Berkeley. While he was at Johns Hopkins, he served as provost for the university for about 11 years. And prior to that, he was on the faculty of the University of California, Berkeley, for 16 years. He has an impressive record that spans all of those particular periods of time. And one of the things that I always tell my law students is that when you have had the opportunity to have had an education in higher education and then have the opportunity to actually work in higher education. The thing that you want to do is really be the complete person. And when I talk about the complete person, it's not only someone who appreciates the academics that go along with higher education, but you also want to know that endemic in all of that are the leadership skills that are required as you advance. And certainly, President Knapp has demonstrated those. He has a fine record of academic achievement, he has done everything that a leader is supposed to do when you lead an institution. He's a superb fundraiser. And the other thing that I like so much about him is that his vision is so good. And here we are in higher education, and it's changing in so many dynamic different ways. But one of the things that's exciting about that change is really looking for opportunities to build synergies, both within the university and outside of the university and the universities that it functions in. And that's one of the things that truly distinguishes President Knapp. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to invite to the podium, who will introduce our guest, the president of George Washington University and my boss, <laughs> Stephen Knapp. <Harris. laughs> uh, thank you, Dean Moran, for that extremely kind uh, introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it really is a pleasure to welcome you to the George Washington University in this sesquicentennial year of our distinguished uh, law school for what I think will be a very enlightening uh, panel discussion. And uh, I want to congratulate the dean for assembling uh, such a distinguished panel to talk about the future of higher education and also applaud the panel topics that panelists have, uh, with, working with the dean have uh, chosen to discuss. These are affordability, globalization, and access and success. I'd like to say just a little bit about the third of those topics, 
which um, was prominently featured in January 2014 when President Barack Obama invited a number of university and college presidents to the White House for a summit on exactly that, that topic of access and success. And of course, this reflects the president's interest in opening opportunities in higher education to uh, people coming from all, uh, all aspects of American life um, and certainly um, minority communities, inner city communities, and those whose <coughs> families have never had the previous experience of attending college and therefore face certain challenges when it comes to just understanding how that process works and, and need uh, uh, you know, a special uh, uh, kind of introduction to the, to the university communities. We, uh, as a result of that discussion at the White House, created a task force on access and success and it's made a number of recommendations. One of those uh, was rather became rather prominent this summer, uh, and even a little bit controversial, and that was the announcement, even though we're not the first institution to do it. In fact, um, we were preceded in this by Dean Morant's former institution, Wake Forest, we became a test optional institution, meaning that uh, applicants to our undergraduate programs would no longer be required to submit SAT and ACT scores. And I just want to say a little about why that's relevant to access and success. You know, when I took the SATs, uh, when I prepared for them, it's actually quite a number of years ago that I did that. My, my, <laughs> my preparation for the SATs consisted entirely of sharpening a number of uh, number two pencils. That's what I did to prepare. Nowadays, um, families with a certain amount of wealth can uh, spend thousands of dollars on tutoring programs. Uh, uh, students in wealthy communities uh, have access often through their schools to, uh, to classes that are not available to students studying in inner city high schools. So one of the consequences of this is that what was really designed to be an egalitarian instrument, a way of identifying academic talent, no matter what schools uh, young people came from, has now become a, a really a, an instrument of inequality because of the differential opportunities that are that are uh, uh, opened as a result of that. And so that's why it was our access and success task force that specifically recommended this. And our and there were there are other reasons too. I mean, as I, I think you've all heard the controversies or read about the controversies. Uh, about SATs and ACTs in terms of uh, cultural bias and other things. But the main driver in this was uh, was opening opportunities in higher education. Of course, that's related to what we've also been doing in affordability. We happen to have a fixed tuition program here for undergraduates. So up to five years, neither the tuition goes up nor, nor does the uh, financial aid, if the students are receiving financial aid, go down. And of course, it's also related to what we're doing in, in the area of, of globalization because we're trying to open our doors to as wide as possible a community of talented students and uh, hoping to attract actually people from all around the world to come to Washington DC and contribute to the, to the growth of our nation uh, as they've done for so many generations. So um, I think these are exactly the right set of topics. This is exactly the right set of topics to discuss today and I'm glad that you were focusing on them. And it's now my honor to introduce today's panelists, starting with Phoebe A. Haddon, who is the Chancellor of Rutgers University Camden. She was previously the Dean of the University of Maryland's Francis King Carey School of Law. She uh, was a member of Temple University's Beasley School of Law for 25 years and has been named by the National Jurist as one of the 25 most influential people in 2012, 2013, and 2014. Chancellor Haddon earned her bachelor's degree from Smith College, her JD from Duquesne, and her LLM from Yale University. Dr. Christopher B. Howard was recently named president of Robert Morris University and will take office there in February 2016. He has served as president of Hamden Sydney College since 2009. He was previously vice president for leadership and strategic initiatives at the University of Oklahoma. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree uh, and was awarded a, pre uh, a prestigious um, uh, at the uh, Air Force Academy and um, was awarded a prestigious Rhodes Scholarship. He earned a doctoral degree from Oxford and then an MBA from Harvard Business School. Dr. Gregory Williams served as president of the City College of New York from 2001 to 2009 and the University of Cincinnati from 2009 to 2012. Earlier, he'd served as dean of the Ohio State University's Moritz School of Law. His best-selling memoir, Life on the Color Line, the true story of a white boy who discovered he was black, has won numerous awards including the Los Angeles Times Award for Best Book of the Year in 1995. He earned his bachelor's degree from Ball State University and, I'm happy to say, is a triple GW alumnus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, he earned his JD, master's, and doctoral degrees here at George Washington. And later tonight, in fact, we will have the pleasure of honoring him 
with the university's Alumni Achievement Award. Oh, wow. so. <laughs> Finally, our moderator this morning is Blake D. Morant. He became dean, uh, the dean and the Robert Kramer Research Professor of Law of the George Washington University's Law School in September 2014, so he's just finished one year here. He previously served for seven years as dean of the Wake Forest University School of Law. Before moving into academia, he served in the Army's Judge Advocate General Corps and worked in private practice. He is currently president of the Association of American Law Schools. He received his bachelor's and JD degrees from the University of Virginia. So again, I'd like to thank Dean Morant for <coughs> pulling this group together and hope you enjoy your time at George Washington uh, and have an uh, informative discussion and that your travels will not be uh, hampered too much by the papal barricades that you'll find <laughs> erected throughout our great capital city. Thanks very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take my place as moderator of the panel. And uh, I thought it would be good before we get into the conversation, and this truly is a conversation, to tell you how this all came about. As uh, President Knapp indicated, I'm president of the Association of American Law Schools, and in that role, I have the opportunity of talking to media concerns all over the country about the current state of American legal education. And at the very beginning of my presidency, I had an interview with the Chronicle of Higher Education, which was taped, and you can view on their website. This isn't a plug. I'm just letting you know. That's where it's there. And in that particular interview, the questions came up about the current state of American legal education, the cost, the debt that students have to undertake, the challenge of students getting jobs, the continued relevancy of American legal education <coughs> and all of the challenges that, are, that it faces with regard to cost and jobs for students, and whether it was still relevant today. And in the course of that conversation, I talked about not only those issues with regard to American legal education, but the idea that all of higher education had these challenges. And if you look across the spectrum, regardless of discipline, those questions come up regardless of the discipline that individuals go to higher education to pursue. And so in the context of that conversation, and since it's been on the website, I received a number of different inquiries from presidents all over the country. I have to say my good friend Chris Howard was one of those. And we talked about those synergies of challenges. And so one of the things I thought would be very good is to have this conversation. It coincides with the 150th anniversary, as we've heard the president talk about, of the law school. And we thought this would be a very good opportunity to bring some talented individuals who are in higher education together and have a conversation about a number of those particular issues. The issues that we're going to talk about, and hopefully we'll have a chance to really have that engagement on all of them in the full fledged, are about six or seven of them. The first starts with the value of higher education, especially that of a liberal arts degree. This came up in my Chronicle interview because if you look at the way law schools educate, it's very similar to what the liberal arts basically provide to their students, critical thinking, writing skills, and the ability to articulate one's views in a cogent way. In addition to that, we're going to examine such issues as student debt and investment, whether it's worth the investment today, given the fact that higher education has become more expensive than it's ever been before, that the market has created a huge competition for students on a national and international basis. In addition, the globalization that has taken the marketplace has certainly had an effect on higher education. How has that affected what we do, both in terms of how the institution functions, how it gets its students, how it gets its faculty, and how it teaches and how it instructs? We'll also look at something that I think is really pretty much ubiquitous throughout any topic that we talk about in higher education, and that is the question of diversity. That we are sending our students out into a world that's far more diverse than it's ever been before, how is higher education addressing that important criteria? And we'll also look at such things as, as entrepreneurialism, that is, how do we instill in our institutions, both those who teach in them, those who direct them, and also in our students, this increased sense that being entrepreneurial is now a very major part of any kind of endeavor once one leaves an institution. 
And last but not least, the one that President Knapp uh, basically touched on, and that has to do with <coughs> academic success. That in bringing students in, what do we do in order to ensure that students achieve the kind of goals that they set out to achieve when they attend these institutions? So we're going to go into each one of those in, in particular detail. I'm going to ask each individual panelist to get us started on those individual topics. And we'd like for you to be involved in the conversation mm -hmm. as well. <clears throat> so when you receive your program, you should have received a card that basically there is like a card. And we'd like for, what we'd like for you to do is if you think of a question as we're talking about any of these particular topics, if you would write your question down, put it on the card, there are members of the staff, members of the staff will raise your hand so everyone can see. There are members of the staff there in the back corner of the room. If you will signal to them, just raise your hand with your card, they'll come and pick it up. They'll make sure that I get it, and then I will then ask the panelists your question. We're doing this this way because this program is being recorded, and so we want to make sure that all of the questions that are being asked are going to be picked up out of recording, and that it will be a very even uh, sort of uh, recording process. I would also like to say that given the range of topics that we have and the limitations of time, I'm going to have to keep things going. This is a part of being Oprah, so I'm going to really keep things going. This is both for my panelists as well as the audience that's there. We're going to try to keep things going. If I have to cut you off, it's not because you're not very cogent or you don't have something that's really relevant. It's just that I'm keeping my eye on that box, which I'm sure all of us would appreciate. Let me also say that I very much look forward after this event is over. If you have questions or would like to engage the panelists, I think there'll be a little bit of time for us to do that on an individual basis. So with those are the ground rules, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And the very first topic is the one that I introduced at the very beginning of the listing, and that has to do with the value of higher education, especially that of the liberal arts. And so I'm going to get us started first with right to my immediate left, uh, Dr. Chris Howard, and then after that, I think uh, also uh, Chancellor Hatton will have a couple comments, and probably, I would think, also Dr. Williams will have a comment for that. So we're just going to go in seriatim. It is one of those overarching topics, and uh, how much you begin? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dean Moran. It's, it's an absolute opportunity, a uh, great uh, honor to be here on this panel and to be able to participate. I wanted to uh, correct uh, uh, one of your comments from earlier on, and that is you said that your boss, you were introducing your boss. I know your boss is right there. It's PJ. Yeah. So, I, so I, I wanted to acknowledge, first and foremost, behind every successful man, PJ sends a surprised woman. And I wanted to point that out. I also wanted to uh, uh, thank you for uh, letting me be a part of this, which is such a distinguished group of colleagues, and I, I'm also very happy, uh, my, my fellow presidents, to provide some diversity, uh, being a non-lawyer up here, so uh, <laughs> uh, I had to put some chlorine in a gene pool, I thought I'd bring that. So I just wanted to make my comments brief uh, and sort of frame a few things around the value of education by talking about a few headwinds that I see in higher education. And then also a little bit about, uh, like I say, the app for that in terms of liberal arts and uh, what, what I think liberal arts brings to the table. Uh, the headwinds that sort of frame the conversation, I think about five or six fold. First off, in the last 20 years, it's been an amazing change in technology such that the real power for determining where you go in terms of who understands information, it actually is flipped. And it actually is the consumer to use probably a wrong term, consumer, the parents, the students that know more quite often than the admissions and enrollment management people do. And that's very, very different. It, 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 you know, there never was a time in history that before the last 10 years where you could take out something like this, ask it a question, hold it to the sky, and get mad if it doesn't give you an answer in three seconds. That means students can do this. I mean, a number of applications coming in on mobile apps now is going to be on, going to be on the rise, and you're going to see probably in the next 10 years, most all applications will be on this. The larger meta point or mega point is that the power now resides with the consumer. They know more. Um, the Great Recession. Um, we, are, we are eking our way out, but still we are feeling the residual effects of a Great Recession where people are thinking more and more about money. When you don't have money, you think a lot about money. And so that's a point. Um, 
people are actually, as Blake was saying, are, are questioning the value and efficacy of of an education as opposed to training that gets me right into a job. And Wall Street and Main Street and businesses are much more impatient about what their students can do when they walk in the door from almost a technical level, right? Uh, as opposed to the deeper education piece. I'll get to that in a second. Um, the last two things is that uh, um, when we think about how we evaluate an education, it used to be kind of a solemn solo enterprise where students would make sense of the institution when they were there, and now they show with mom and daddy uh, with them. Um, and this is a big deal, especially in the undergrad institution I lead now in these types of schools. Uh, we talk about uh, 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 tiger moms or, or, or hyperactive parents. I, I like to call them curling parents. You know that, that uh, uh, sport curling where they clear all the ice off? That's what parents do. They show up and they want to clear all the ice off and make sure that their kid has a perfect education. So, you know, even when we were going through 100 years ago, getting our education at our respective institutions, it was never perfect. It's just that mom and dad didn't know about it and they didn't have your number on speed dial. <laughs> so it changes how we think about education. That's part of the rubric. And then the changing marketplace. I don't want to get to the 99% or 1% or piece, but it's pretty flat out there in terms of the marketplace, whether it be the legal profession or all other professions. So that's putting a lot of pressure and, and a real microscope on um, our, our spotlight, as it were, on what's happening in higher education. So I don't know what's tougher being a dean of a law school or being the president of a liberal arts college, because I think we're particularly uh, in, in the sort of the headlights on that. Uh, I would also add that there's a breakdown between what we're doing, what we're perceived to be doing. There was a study done by uh, it was either ace, I can't remember, but 90% of provosts think they're preparing students for the workplace, right? Uh, but only 10% of CEOs think that students are prepared, prepared for the workplace. So Houston, we have a problem, right? There's just this real moment happening. That, that, that's what we're sort of stepping into. Having said that, if you read the literature from the American Association of Colleges and Universities, AACU, the, the great study they did, as Blake pointed out, what people in the, in the workforce say, business leaders, what they say, they say they want people to think critically, write well, are well-spoken, that have a sense of humanity, of civilization, and can bring that to the table. And there's no better place to get that than whether it be a legal education, a liberal education, a liberal arts education. The challenge we run into is that, and I'll close my remarks off here, I don't want to go too long, is that getting that first job right Right, and making sure that people feel like the employees feel like they have the people that can do what they need to do. <clears throat> understanding that the deeper education to succeed in the workplace really is rooted in liberal arts. And so, what we have to do, we have a communication problem. We also have, and I'll be honest with you, we also have a training problem. I always tell people that they get great liberal arts degrees in whatever topic it could be. It could be history, philosophy, whatever. I actually read about this from a woman who'd gone to Princeton. She was an art history major. She said, "I got a lot of." Big time internships on Wall Street too, and um, and and not to poo poo at all. I mean that happened to President Obama. I'm not going to do that. I'm not poo pooing at all. The art history degree. It's just a recognition that if you're going to step into the workplace right now, we need to do things to ensure that people get the training they need, but never let that get in the way of the education that we provide. So I'll kind of stop there. So we've given some headwinds and said that there's a disconnect, but deeper education is going to be fundamentally important for whatever part of civil society you choose to lead in and manage it. Excellent beginning. Chancellor Hatton? Uh, so I will incorporate by reference everything that he said uh, and cut to the chase. Uh, I think that uh, it is so important for us to emphasize that this is a fast-paced changing world and that specialized, very defined jobs uh, or directions within a discipline really can't have the same sort of agility that a liberal arts education or liberal education, I'm gonna argue, uh, offers. And uh, that's what drew me to college. It drew me to the kind of law schools that I've been involved in that are focused on liberal learning and critical analysis. Uh, and uh, it has drawn me to the particular institution that I now um, am a part of, uh, which has a very strong faculty of arts and sciences, but also has an art area that is uh, really 
connected to all of the disciplines, including law and a di digital studies program that weds all of those things because we have to be agile. We have to uh, be able to think outside of the box. And uh, the knowledge is, is not only huge, but it is developing at such a fast pace that you can't train in a specific area and expect to, to actually uh, be able to be prepared for the future, even tomorrow, much less you know, for, for a future job that um, hasn't even been thought of at this point. Uh, the other part of it, I think, is the diversity part. And that is uh, that uh, have, it has already been concluded based on data that having the opportunity to interact with people of diverse interests and uh, backgrounds really makes for a much more creative process. And so having that opportunity, both in law school as well as as an undergraduate school, to interact with other people uh, is really critically important. It's critically important for your learning, for all the reasons we've already talked about, but it's also critically important in terms of your engagement. The data confirmed that we can hold on to students and people are satisfied with their education to the extent that they can interact with people of diverse backgrounds. It's a real challenge, and we'll talk about this in the future uh, 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 today, about how we uh, uh, permit uh, or uh, invite the opportunity for diverse people to come together. But certainly, the notion of kind of siloed disciplines um, is, is not going to be the way for that to happen. Uh, the other part of it, though, is that we live in a global society, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, and <laughs> Being global means being agile and being able to think outside of the box, uh, be innovative, understand the world uh, beyond your own neighborhood. And uh, these are issues particularly important, not less important, for people who are first generation students, like many of ours are. And uh, it really means uh, that we've got to give them the chances uh, to do that kind of uh, disruptive learning, uh, not less. And so it really pains me, actually, to hear people talking about workforce development or job-focused training at the undergraduate level at a time when first-generation students are really the, the uh, huge majority of people who will be coming through um, our higher education. Just when people need to have that liberal exposure, you don't cut it off. Very good. Very good. Dr. Thank you, Blake. It's uh, really great to be here with this uh, illustrious panel. And I'd like to take us in a little different direction, kind of allude to something that uh, Phoebe has talked about. Uh, anyone who's read my book or knows much about me knows that what I like to do is I like to tell stories uh, that I hopefully prove a point. And I think about uh, <laughs> and I think about uh, the value of education. I think about opportunity. Uh, the president talked about it. Uh, Phoebe has certainly alluded to it as uh, Chris as well. <clears throat> and I saw that as educational opportunity. As Phoebe indicated, uh, you know, most of us up here are first generation college students. Uh, my family, I lived on public assistance when I was a kid. We had no uh, ability to be able to pay for any college. Uh, but I believe that it was going to provide some opportunities for me that otherwise I was not going to have. And actually I did, I worked my way through undergraduate school as a deputy sheriff. When I was here at GW, I spent four years as a public school teacher in Falls Church while getting my degrees here as well. And it provided a great opportunity for me, one that I'm forever grateful for. Um, but, uh, and it was really worth the sacrifice. Now, one of the things I was able to do it in those days, because working full time, you could pay for school. These days you can't. Uh, and so that really does close the door of opportunity for a lot of folks, unless you have some type of assistance. This also, and you know, a lot of people these days talk about, well, is education really worth it? Um, and for some people it may not be, but not everybody is either a Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. Uh, I, this has brought home to me in a very significant way. About 20 years ago, about 25 years ago now, my wife and I adopted two boys from Honduras, twin brothers. Uh, and even though in our family, my wife and I, we have about 11 degrees all together, uh, for 10 years, our goal was to get two high school diplomas. Um, and there were times we were not sure we were going to be able to get those two high school diplomas. 
I say that all that to say that uh, unfortunately our boys, our twins are not going to college and I think about them and I think about their lives. They're now 30. They've kind of bounced around a little bit for the last 10 years and I've been trying to kind of get them into a direction. But the lack of higher education means that their opportunities are going to be limited. Obviously, they fortunately come from a family where Unlike my family when I was growing up, the wealth is very different. But still, I do think about the opportunities that are going to be available for them. And that's the one thing that why I value higher education so much is because it does expand your world. It does provide opportunities for you and your family to provide a true transformation in those families' lives. Wonderful. Well, as you can tell, we have some wonderful panelists, so this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to sort of germinate a question that relates to one of the ones that we we're going to talk about, but it comes up in the context of all the comments you gave about the value of education. So this really is framed around students and the opportunity for students to go to college. Um, as many of you said, many are first generation. I'm second generation. My mother was the only one of Ten in her family. She grew up on a rural farm in South Carolina. She was the only one of ten to go to college. I was her only child. I had two choices, either go to college and be academic or die. <laughs> and so I kind of like living, so here I am. But it sort of underscores this idea about opportunity for students. And I'd love to get your comments about how do we ensure that we are providing an opportunity for students, those, particularly those students who may not traditionally have college in their sights, because I see this as an endemic part of the world that we are now living in, a global world as we've all commented on, and the relevancy of education in and of itself, because just as, as uh, Dr. Williams said, Oftentimes, opportunity comes with higher education. So I would love to get your comments on that. Yes. yes. So uh, as long as we're uh, sharing stories, I'm a fourth generation college educated uh, family. I come from that and a fourth generation lawyer family. So uh, I have a very different perspective mm -hmm. on education. It wasn't do it or die. It was assume that yes. you would go to college. Mm -hmm. That wasn't even the question. The question yeah. is, what do you do after that? Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was true for women as well as for men. So I'm very proud of that. But it also makes me so conscious of the fact that so many people don't have that understanding, yes. even now, mm -hmm. even as much mm -hmm. as we're talking about higher education. To be able to even ask the question, does it have value, mm -hmm. um, is striking to me. It continues to be. Uh, but uh, I got uh, baptized very quickly uh, when I became chancellor. Uh, because I am in a first-generation institution, and I began to read the data and the uh, live stories of the folks that um, I actually interacted with. And what I know now is that if you come from a family where there has not been a high school diploma, you are only about 5% likely to be able to go on to college. 5% of those people go on to college. And so we've got to intervene in that mm -hmm. distressing number. There's no question about it. How you intervene, what kinds of interventions work, is a different story. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, that that's the case. Mm -hmm. And it's the case that's more pronounced for me because I'm in the city of Camden. I'm in the city of Camden where the number of uh, college two-year, not co uh, college, but two-year, is about uh, 10%. And uh, the level of um, opportunities for people have been very, very small and marginalized. Uh, so what I am concerned about is how we move those numbers. Uh, and uh, many people are engaged in the debate about whether or not it's race or it's uh, economics that really drive this. I think it's both. I don't think that you can separate the uh, racial aspect of history, but also the ongoing discrimination that occurs in terms of, as I was talking about, the interventions for people who are in public school versus uh, private school or racialized uh, environments versus uh, uh, um, 
uh, uh, more privileged white environments. Uh, so you can't divorce those things, uh, and they work on each other. Uh, so that means that we have to also be mindful of who it is that we're going to be uh, training as they come into college. And it means, sadly, that if they're coming from public school, there have to continue to be interventions. Sure. And I'm going to tell one little story. Um, I went to um, a uh, program last Saturday uh, for uh, training some uh, uh, tutors that go into the public school in a, a fairly prosperous uh, uh, neighborhood school in, in Philadelphia, the Emlyn School. There was uh, a third grade focus on our retention. We were going to all be tutoring third graders. There is no science teacher for these, these ch children. Just at the time when we're talking about STEM, this is not Camden, this is Philadelphia. Just at the time we're talking about STEM, we're talking about college preparation, there is no science teacher. And that's because of the, the poorly financed public education system across the country. And we've got to talk about how to fix that. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I'd like to piggyback on a couple of things that Phoebe has said. Um, one, with regard to first-generation students, it's very clear that the highest dropout rate of any group in college is first-generation students, uh, bar no exception whatsoever. Um, I was president of the City College of New York. We had a lot of first-generation students there. Same thing at the University of Cincinnati. One of the things we did at Cincinnati is we put together what we call a Gen 1 house, uh, where we had first-generation students that lived together for an entire year uh, with uh, counselors and others. We really controlled uh, uh, tutorial assistance, the whole thing. Actually, in over our experimental period, we had basically a 90% graduation rate of the folks that had gone through the Gen 1 house. Uh, that was really critical, and we continued to try to expand that. The other thing we have... Um, have to really have to focus on is graduation. And actually, I remember when I was president of City College that I had one vice president of student affairs was greeting the new group of students who came in as freshmen saying, we want you to enjoy your time here at City College, whether that's four or five or six years. I said, no, stop the music. <laughs> Basically, your goal here is to get a degree. We want to try to get that in four years. That's the goal. I even had to get on the dean of the School of Architecture, who was telling students, well, if you feel like taking a gap year, can you imagine a gap year? And I said, no, stop the music. Basically, what we want to do is to focus on that and make sure when the students come in, because again, first gen generation students don't really understand there's a danger the longer it takes, the less likely you are to get the degree. And so there has to be a real focus on why you are there. And I had to get on another uh, faculty member as well, actually program director. She was saying to me, she said, well, President, you know, if a student has two or three years, they really are better off uh, than they would have been otherwise. And I said, well, tell me what job is looking for two to three years of college. Uh, they're not looking for folks with two to three years of college. The focus has to be on graduation. So as we get these first generation students come in, we have to make sure that they're clear what the focus is and that we keep them on that track because the longer it takes, the less likely it's going to happen for them. You know, it's interesting as I hear those comments that you've made, particularly with regard to this access to education for students who may be first generation or who are financially challenged, it certainly does put a lot of pressure on institutions to try to build some kind of bridge with those individuals so they have those opportunities. And this dovetails with a question that I just received from the audience, and that is, how, how do institutions balance financial, I guess, competing norms that they have in order to address these problems? So as, as you basically have pointed out, you have a constituency of students out there who may not be as prepared to go to college as they might be, which means if you admit them, the possibility of attrition goes way up. So you have an obligation to do something about that. But that higher education is so constrained financially right now to do this. And I really love the question that the audience put because 
what part of that question was also how do you get the faculty involved in this so that they see this as an endemic part of their responsibility as well to make sure that not only that we the <coughs> students, but that we can make sure that they see when they go through. Yeah. Well, the faculty part is easy. You just hire a good dean <laughs> or provost, and there you go. And like Bravo. A president. Bravo. Bravo. Yeah, 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 yeah. So obviously, President Knapp has taken care of business by hiring the right person. Um, I, I want to kind of synthesize that question with the comments that were made earlier with the uh, um, idea of, of uh, recognizing that getting to and through is important and uh, the difficulties in doing so. I kind of broke it down into three M's, and I think it, it'll, it'll touch the main points here. Um, mindset is important. So to answer the question directly, institutions have to have a mindset that it is their moral imperative to get people to and through and give them real opportunities. I'm coming from a rigorous institution of high standards, Hampton Sydney College, where it used to be, and also having gone to the Air Force Academy, and these are somewhat anomalies, but they speak to a different mindset that said, if you come here, look to your right, first day of class, the president, superintendent, <coughs> look to your right, look to your left, and in four years, um, two of those people, uh, one of those, one of you all will not be there. Now go to school. Good luck to you, right? Go, um, um, it's a very sort of Dickinsonian approach to student life. Uh, that's changing. Uh, at the service academies, at your most elite institutions, it, it is changing. And I think that mindset that says, not that we're going to lower the academic standards, but just we're going to meet you where you are, like a coach would say, like, meet you where you are and take you where you need to go. So that coaching mindset, that mentality with students, whether they be first generation, uh, lower socioeconomic strata, uh, people of color, um, uh, women that have again, you, a unique set of circumstances that brings them to the institution, being mindful of that is, I think, the first part. And that's where the entrepreneurial and interesting ideas can kind of come from. The other part about mindset, I'm second generation college, university. My mom and dad both attended. Um, and the mindset, uh, that, that, that my grandmother had years ago, who I think made it maybe fifth grade, was kind of like what your mom said, you're going to go to school or I'm, I'm going to beat you to death. I mean, you know, ask my youngest aunt who skipped school the beginning of uh, high school, the beginning of her first semester, she skipped school. My grandmother, my big mama, was waiting for her at the door when she came there and said, I will just take you to school the rest of the year. And so she walked through the school every day. That's a mindset that even though I didn't get a great education, you are going to get an education no matter what. And that mentality is not necessarily as pervasive in certain zip codes in our, in our community. It kind of goes back to what the president said about the SATs and prep and this and the other. It's a different mindset. And not that we can go back to the good old fashioned time. I didn't want to get beat by my big mom. I don't want to bring, it, I don't want to bring that back. But the mindset that education, as Phoebe said, is the pathway. You know, we have a lot of different people going a lot of different ways. And like the president said, yeah, may maybe you are Jay-Z or Steve Jobs, but maybe you're not. Um, so I think the mindset is right, uh, important. Number two is money. I'm going to make two other points here. Uh, money is, is very, very important. Resources are the lubricant that allow you to get things done. The more resources you have, the more you can do, uh, the more you can meet people where they are, take them where they need to go. I want to make a plug for private universities like this great one that I'm here now at uh, George Washington going to Robert Morris from Hampton, Sydney. In fact, institutional financial aid has actually increased during the Great Recession. So in many ways, people are paying a bit less coming to our schools um, from, from, from media backgrounds. Now, higher socioeconomic strata is a different story, and that's because of the great support of boards and alumni, et cetera, and, and, and funders. So let's keep that in mind. Public funding, not to ding my my colleagues on the public side at all, that's actually falling oh, off. Damn. And so that I mean a lot of the big studies say there's just less money. I read in Virginia, I think it's down like seven percent in the last eight yes. years. And so we've got to be cognizant that you know people number one reason one of the number one pe reason people leave school is they, they can't afford it. So we've got to be aware of that. And and, and finally the, and this is is what uh, what Greg said very much spot on. It, it's it's about two and through. Kip Academy does a lot of great work with students in the uh, K twelve area. Their mindset is not just getting you through college, getting you to college, but getting people through. And that means, again, programming and ideas that make sense for where people are. Sending them off on a gap year doesn't make sense for a lot of students. It does make sense for some, but for, for a certain social economic strategy, probably, probably not. And I think that, that uh, the moral imperative of to and through is the next part that's, uh, that, that our government can do and our public and privates can do and our foundations as well. <laughs> So just following up on, on um, Dr. Howard's point, how, 
how do institutions address that problem? I mean, how do we address the problem of students who may not be as prepared to go to college, but are there? How do we ensure that they are successful? And this dovetails with the question that came from the audience. How do we not only make sure they get through school, but that they're able to use their degree after I had one question that came in. Are institutions truly invested in the success of that after they graduate? Mm -hmm. So I'd love to kind of So let me start out by saying I'm the public person here, <laughs> and that's the um, oh. formally, right? But um, that is the case that at, it is the case that at one point uh, many public institutions had 70 cent, uh, 70 percent support by the state. Um, now it is less than 30% for most places. Uh, it's a dramatic change and it's been in the last 10 years or so. Um, it poses some additional problems because um, uh, whereas private institutions have been used to fundraising and being entrepreneurial, state institutions haven't been. And it is a comp more complicated problem because uh, what's happened is that many of the very good publics have now uh, uh, tuition discounted. So what they have basically done is to underwrite the support of poorer students by raising the cost of uh, education for paying students. The result is that they are after the very highest level um, and able uh, uh, students, the very rich, to underwrite the very poor. They have the ability, those larger institutions, I'm talking about the Michigans and the Virginias, they have the ability then to underwrite the support that you're talking about that is really critical, the critical interventions that I was talking about, the mentoring, uh, the uh, strong advising, uh, the uh, faculty that engage undergraduates in their research, the uh, opportunity for students to do uh, uh, internships and other kinds of things that keep them engaged but also give them very concrete learning skills that will be translatable into the workforce. Uh, for those of us who are in smaller research universities, uh, we don't have that kind of means. Uh, we are first generation, we have been uh, historically. Uh, but what is important, I think, is defining your mission uh, in these contexts. And the mindset is one thing, but a clearly defined mission uh, that all faculty and administrators have to wrap around. Uh, so if we are going to be devoted to first generation students and we are looking to make sure that they succeed, then our mission is to get them through uh, and the the, the uh, resources that we have have to be devoted to that. So that means that some of the things that we would love to do, we simply cannot do it because we are mission driven. Uh, and it's going to be critically more important for people to uh, be careful in defining their missions uh, and then to look for outside support um, so that those interventions are, nece are, are uh, feasible. Otherwise, we won't be able to support those students through. And I want to put a plug in not only for the uh, graduation, but also the pre-K uh, and K through 12 support. Because ultimately, I think some of us are, uh, most of us are going to have to support the public education system uh, so that it is sort of, I'm calling it now, cradle to grave. Sure. Uh, we really have to support that. And I, and I know Dr. Muntz has a comment about yeah, actually, I uh, do want to piggyback on a couple of things that have been said. And Blake, you raised the point about how do you get folks on board on that. Um, and I think it's pretty simple to a certain extent. I've had this discussion with faculty, for example, and asked them, well, what do you really like about a 25 or 35 percent graduation rate? Are you willing for me to go out and tell seven out of 10 students they are not going to graduate from this institution? It's embarrassing. Uh, and folks really have to pull together on that say, hey, we've got this mission and all of us have a role to play. And there's a lot of things we can do. I think we can do a lot of curriculum development. We can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but fundraising, of course, is a key. I was 
uh, basically mostly state institutions or state located institutions as my <laughs> a good friend Gordon Gee, now president uh, of West Virginia, uh, used to say uh, because the funding has been declining. I've spent a lot of time fundraising. Actually, I've been the major fundraiser in three billion dollar campaigns. And I can tell you a billion dollars doesn't go as far as it used to. Uh, uh, but uh, obviously that's uh, one of the things that really has to happen. But it's something that everyone, it's kind of all hands on deck. Everyone has to be involved in it from the curriculum to the faculty um, to the uh, alumni and others have to be involved in this effort. It's not something that the president can order. Um, when I was a... Uh, uh, Apropos of a point, when I was dean of the law school at Ohio State, I asked the woman, a friend who was an attorney general, I said, what's it like being in charge of uh, 5,000 lawyers in the state? She said, well, Greg, there's a lot of distance between do and done. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you, uh, you really have to get everybody involved in this. That's so cute. It, 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 yeah, this, this will be very quick, as uh, I was inspired by Phoebe's comments. One of the things that we as institutions of higher learning do well is study and examine. And we should be, able to be, we should very much be students of our own institutions. So we know who is at risk and why they're at risk and what programs might work. I commend Sean Harford out at the University of Pennsylvania who done some, some great work on black males and saying, what are the, let's talk, let's talk about the young men that are failing out. How about the ones that are thriving? And there are like four or five factors that most of them have in common. One of them is someone in their life, no matter who it was, a parent, a teacher, a mentor, a coach who said, you are going to go to college. And they, no matter what, they kept beating that drum. That's something that we can sort of be hyper aware of. I'll close it this way. Frederick Douglass said in Anacostia years ago, somebody talked to him right before he died. He said, what, what, what's your advice to me? And the great old man said, agitate, agitate, agitate. We should analyze, analyze, analyze institutional effectiveness, institutional research. I can tell you that my current institution, I know who's at risk. You know, I'm like the bionic man. For those of y'all remember the bionic man, like doo -doo -doo -doo. I can see it, I'm like, oh, I know it. I know what the challenges are for this young man, um, and I know what we need to do that. Now we gotta find the funds to do it, and get, and get everybody to come along, but nonetheless, I think that's part of it. Yeah. Let me say, as, as I hear all of your commentary, a couple of things really occur to me. One of them has to do with the sort of holistic approach to education that we now have or need to have. So so historically speaking, when I went to college in the Stone Age, as so my students say, you know, students would go to college and it was pretty much assumed that, oh, you're gonna be successful, you, we throw you out there, you, you find your way, you sort of go, and then things sort of happen for you. And now, there seems to be a need to be more holistic about this at every single stage, before they get there. And as you said, uh, Chancellor Patton, about the idea of really focusing in on public education before they even get there, if the quality of that is not good, mm -hmm. then it's going to make it even harder if we can get them into college. Mm -hmm. Then when you get them into college, you have to give them the tools for this complex, diverse world that they're going to go in. And this now merges into a question that I have here. You've heard a lot of conversation out there about expanding the opportunity for education for a number of different constituencies by maybe broadening the, I guess, option of community college. And I'm sure you've seen uh, a couple of presidential candidates who said, you know, we should make community college free. <laughs> that would be the gateway for a number of students to really go on with their higher education. But this one questioner says that they fear that this investment in only community colleges is gonna create a class system, that you're gonna have certain students who only have that, can only afford that. And then you'll have richer students who are able to have a traditional four-year education. So I, I lob that out to you to get your commentary about that, because on first blush, one would think, oh, having free community colleges is a great thing. You know, now we have this wonderful arm that everybody gets a post-secondary education. But does it create other problems in terms of opportunities for students who can't afford it? Well, I, I don't see that as a real problem, actually. I think most of the community colleges that I'm aware of have pretty good articulation agreements. Um, and in fact, when I was president of City College, we had something like, I think there's nine community colleges in New York City 
and we had agreements with both most of them uh, where students would be able to make the transition to the four-year institution. I think that's worked out uh, pretty well. Uh, you have actually, when you take a community college student in, um, you have had a student who's had some success. Um, and so they generally know what's necessary. So I'm not really as concerned about that. Uh, I think it can be a great vehicle. And you see uh, really a lot of schools around the country that are heavily recruiting, particularly for diversity uh, mm -hmm. from community colleges, because even when I was at the University of Iowa, uh, we had some great relationship with community colleges because it costs less. Uh, folks can do the undergraduate work, you know, the initial work that they need to do mm -hmm. and then transfer to the university. Um, so over my career, I've seen it really uh, more positive than negative and uh, greater opportunities are provided for students who frankly uh, wouldn't have the resources to go, go directly to a four-year institution. Very good. So to um, add on to that, uh, I am in an institution where over 51% of the students do transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, they transfer not only from community and county colleges, uh, but also from other four-year institutions because we're small. We're 6,500 students. Uh, Rutgers, New Brunswick is 65,000. Uh, so it's a very different environment. Mm -hmm. And many people who come from County College or who come from places where they weren't getting the kind of support come to us. Uh, but that was not intentional. Uh, mm -hmm. It was uh, because the word got around. Uh, and uh, we now use data to inform us about, well, who are those folks who are likely to succeed when they do come in and what do we have to include in our articulation agreements or otherwise to support the people that we know are coming through? Sure. Uh, and then what is the real mix of students that you might want to have? All of those things can be data-driven to a greater extent than they have been in the past. Uh, but they also, I believe strongly, have to be mission-driven. Mission so you have to really have your faculty embrace a mission or understand what they're embracing if it's not consistent with what, what has been articulated in the past. And so what we did last year was to have a student um, retreat for faculty, uh, and we gave them the data. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was surprising to them because they really didn't appreciate who it was that was coming through in as intentional ways as one should have. Uh, even if they were thinking about their own curriculum development or their uh, teaching styles. Uh, so uh, that has helped us to think about what we might like over the next five years. Uh, and it will include some uh, uh, um, uh, information that is also, also informing us about what we do and what we don't do. So for example, we learned that many transfer students actually do complete uh, their education, uh, greater percentages actually than first uh, year students do. Uh, so that made us look more closely at what we were doing in the first year to those first generation students who were coming straight through. Um, on the other hand, uh, we also know from other data that engagement is really important if you're going to be able to have somebody succeed. So whether it's four years or six years, you've got to have them feel connected. Mm -hmm. So some of the programs that I'm sure we'll talk about at some point, like civic engagement, experiential learning, uh, opportunities to engage in problem solving that is real, uh, those kinds of things can bring people in and keep them. They keep them through the four or six years, however long it's gonna be, but they also keep them engaged in a lifelong uh, learning process. And so yeah. that's a critical thing. The chance I've had this comment dovetail nicely with the question I just got with the audience, and that is, should we rethink the four-year model? I mean, one of the questions that came in is that, given everything that we've said about how the entire universe has changed today, even since all of us went to college, is the four-year model really dated? Should we look more flexibly at how we give this education? So we've already talked about two year. We talked about what we get, need to give students in order to, you know, sort of make it when they get back and get out. We've talked about preparing students to even go to college. We have the four year that magic four year model. Is it outdated? Should we revise it? 
Yeah, I, I see Senator Warner from Virginia quite often. I think he's doing a fine job. He always tells me, President Howard, uh, where's my three-year degree from Hampton, Sydney? And I said, well, Mr. Senator Warner, you, you've got your Senate colleagues and I've got my faculty. So uh, I can't do this by edict, um, nor can you. Your gang of six, your gang of eight, you've got to get through you know, at least 61 to make it happen. I've got a plurality I need to get through because there is a mindset. Uh, but if we think about this, you know, we don't want education to be something that's like I, I'm, a, I'm an Air Force Academy graduate. I, I like to tweet, tease West Point and say it's 200 years of tradition unimpaired by progress. And so <laughs> I hope there were some West Pointers out there. We, we, we don't. We don't we, joke. <laughs> no, I'm not. But we don't. We, we don't want to be unimpaired by progress just because we're educators. Right. I mean, could you imagine a doctor practicing medicine the same way they did 200 years ago? whilst we deliver pedagogy in a way that the monks did years ago. Pick out your pens and your papers. Well, I'll, I'll really lecture the book to you or write it down, and in a year you'll, ha you'll have your book. And so whether it be modalities of teaching, the four-year model, going to three years, you mentioned that the community college articulation agreements, dual, uh, dual credit, dual enrollment, where you know students are showing up with almost associate degrees out of high school. These are not perfect. They have to be done well. The next move being competency-based education. I know that uh, Joe up uh, LeBlanc uh, up at uh, uh, Southern Paul. New Hampshire, uh, Paul. Paul, sorry, sorry, Paul up in, uh, well, he's getting lots of money every, you know, you see him everywhere on TV with good. Southern yeah, New Hampshire, <laughs> but, uh, but he's doing some work with Secretary yeah. Duncan on competency-based yeah. education, so I like it. I like, you know, we're going to get the entrepreneurship. I like the fact that we're coming up with many viable pathways to a successful, good life, to bring Aristotle into it, right? There are many, many pathways. My, my wife and my mother took many community college courses. One ended up graduating from Temple, one ended up graduating from the University of Texas at Dallas, but, but for the community college system and the sort of the poppery they were able to do, they wouldn't have been successful. I have students that show up, uh, back when I was at the University of Oklahoma, I remember one kid showed up, he was basically a junior in college, but a freshman, in, uh, uh, with freshman uh, junior credit-wise, but freshman year-wise. And so does it need to take three or four more years? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. And so I think the question is spot on. I think we have to be willing to kind of shake things up and realize there'll be lots of ways to get there. And also putting my other, my liberal hats, liberal arts college I had back on, it's lifelong learning. I mean, going back to community college to finish off some skills and round out some skills, very, very important, very, very critical. Sometimes that, sometime that can be done online as well. So I'm all for thinking about it, but doing it, and this way the faculty get it 100% right, doing it well. So the reason why I was uh, uh, saying Paul, because um, he made an interesting comment uh, at the New President's Summit uh, at Harvard last summer, and I attended that summit, and he was talking about three different ways of thinking about learning in the context of higher education. Uh, they happen to be the three that are now part of Southern New Hampshire, which is where he is. Uh, the first is the liberal arts campus four-year style. Uh, and it's usually thought of and probably most attractive to young people who have time and also are looking for life-changing experiences. Uh, uh, that are, their parents want them to have those <laughs> life-changing experiences. And so you have that carefully protected environment for learning. You teach them the lifelong learning opportunity. You get them engaged in learning. Uh, but they also are having some other things going on in their lives. The second one is uh, people who have already had that experience and need to have some other kinds of um, uh, evidence of success and knowledge acquisition. And that's the competency-based approach that is now being um, both criticized and lauded, depending mm -hmm. on who you talk to, uh, but it's in the developmental stage. And it really is thinking about not a 14-week or a semester-long um, uh, uh, context for learning, but a learning as you go, you know, and you get a certificate and you show it to your employer and you're done. Uh, and it can be two weeks, it can be one hour, it can be, verify what you already know, uh, but it's quick, fast paced, it is not for those folks who need those other experiences. But it's a critical thing that uh, ought to be included. Those aren't necessarily taught by the people who taught, uh, teach 
in the liberal arts campus environment. Yeah. Uh, and neither are the uh, understandings of what knowledge is sure. and competency. The third thing is online, and that's obviously pervasive at this point. And most of us, not necessarily all faculty, but most of us have now online learning of some sort within our institutions. Again, they may not be taught by the same people as those who like the 14 week. Mm -hmm. Some of them are, though, because those are very often creative people who yeah. want to uh, try something different. And it certainly has been verified that a good online experience, and I'm somebody who was not a believer starting off, that's especially that, yeah. you know, as law dean, but a very good online experience is tremendous. And it is better than some classroom teaching, even at its height. Uh, so we're continuing to get information about these alternatives. Those are three very different ways and they shouldn't have to be one or the other. In southern New Hampshire, all three of them are being used. Uh, everyone isn't at the same campus. Some people aren't at a campus. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are things that suggest that we need to disrupt what we're doing in the past, or at least think about whether there are alternatives, and let them, let them rise. Well, I think that Phoebe is absolutely right. Um, I remember a couple, a few years ago when the governor of Ohio said, we, we need three-year degrees. Yeah. And my faculty was absolutely yeah, outraged, absolutely. outraged. Um, and <coughs> I said, well, you know, we need to be a little flexible in this. I think there are some times we can do a three-year degree, and we need to seriously think about that. I remember when I started in law school teaching, actually, we offered a two-year law school degree, mm -hmm. um, and the folks seemed to get through it pretty well and become pretty good lawyers, uh, and we felt that we were not sacrificing the curriculum the way that we had developed that. Actually, just a couple of years ago, I decided that I wanted to get an MBA, uh, which is now my 11th degree, but that's beside <laughs> the point. The, uh, but I said, I want to do it in a year, uh, and I found a school in New York that I could do it in a year. Uh, it worked out perfectly. I serve on a number of corporate boards, and I felt the MBA would be very helpful to me. We need to think about the audiences that are out there, what their needs and what they want to do. Right. And I was very pleased with the, with the way it worked for me. So, yes, we need to be open. Uh, distance education certainly can play a big role here as well. Uh, certificates and other opportunities um, are, are things that we really need to take advantage of. We haven't in the past. Faculty's resisted this a lot. And I, you know, I have to confess, when I was a faculty member, I resisted I these things as well. I remember when they were going to cut my criminal law uh, class from five hours to three hours, say, no, no, there's no way in the world <laughs> that anyone's ever going to learn the criminal law they need to know in three hours. <laughs> well, they did, and they do. <laughs> and so we need to kind of get past that. Well, you know, this card is so many different uh, ideas and questions that I have, and it sort of dovetails with some of the questions I have here. Uh, let me ask you this, and this basically relates to a couple of things we've already said, and that is, given the fact that, well, let me put it this way, and this is more of a comment than it is a question. I really do believe that we've entered an era where we can no longer consider education to be the static form that fits all. So, I, you know, one of the things that I've often said about a four-year go away to college experience is that the education that we get in an institution is not only the doctrinal we get in classroom, but it's oftentimes the bridge to adulthood for yeah. many students. It certainly was for me. The first time I moved out of my mother's mm -hmm. house, in addition to learning all the things I learned in those classrooms, I met different people. I, I was exposed to so many other kinds of cultures and ideas, which many people, including myself, feel that that's a very important part of higher education because it's a lifelong sort of trajectory that it, it sort of forms you with. So with that as your, as a foundation, let me ask you this question, and this dovetails the question we have here. How do we educate, I guess, uh, legislative stakeholders, parents of students and students themselves on that holistic value of higher education. Uh, because there seems to be, 
and you correct me if I'm wrong, all of you, I'm just dean of a little law school, mm -hmm. you guys are all presidents of the university, I see that there is a lot of misconceptions on the part of the consumer public about why higher education is valued. And a lot of this is sort of firm, I guess, confirmed by what they see in the media. You know, it's the expense quotient, is it going to get me a job? Have we done a very good job of really being public relations people to really educate them on why higher education is a valuable thing? Please. So I'll be, a little, I'll be a little bit contrary in this regard. Um, I think we can talk to her blue in the face. I think we can do all the media campaigns we want to do. And I'm involved in a lot of great organizations that come up with very great analytics and pithy comments that talk about why this works. But, uh, you know, it's like the old Wendy's commercial. Show me the beef. Where's the beef, right? And people want to see this connection between their education. They want to be good citizens. With, but they also want a piece of the American dream, which is partially social economic. So I think we do ourselves a disservice by saying, sitting on our, on our hills with our gold laurels uh, and our you know, philosopher kings and, and saying, thou should listen to me and you will be a great person. But I need to pay the bills. Uh, I, I, I like to tell stories too, Greg, so I got a quick one for you. Um, I was with my barber. <laughs> I actually do have a barber. <laughs> and he said something to me, his name was Anthony, and he said, you know, my daughter's the first generation to go to college. She started two years ago. She's going to a historically black college up in, up in, in, in Virginia. And he says, Doc, what do you think, what kind of job is she going to get when she graduates? I just want her to have a level of success that I wasn't able to achieve. We shouldn't poo-poo that. We should come up with ways where it works with the educational enterprise. You can be a great citizen. Gallup does some great work on well-being. Part of financial well, part of being well, and, and I think uh, an adjusted citizen, an engaged citizen, not just engaged student, is to have a modicum of financial wealth so you can actually eat food and wear clothing. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. All right? And you can still read the New York Times and understand it and digest. You can still be an informed citizen goes to the poll. You can still be part of the poll. This is thing we talk about, talk about. But I just think um, I don't mind the public relations campaigns. There is an education thing we can do on the margin. But at the end of the day, let's create ways where we do both the education necessary to be good, to live good lives, and the training and education, the training and the education we need to do to ensure they get good jobs, whether they be for-profit, non-profit, etc. But can, can I interject something on that? And I think we can all agree with that point. I hear a butt coming. <laughs> but it's an and. Oh, the, oh, but. but it sort of relates back to something that Phoebe said a little bit earlier. And that is, if we are now educating students to go out into a world that is intensely more global, and things are changing all the time, how do we reconcile this criticism that we're not preparing students to get a job as soon as they go, you know, leave? And this notion that, my God, jobs are no longer static. I mean, things change all the time, which tends to suggest that a liberal arts education is the best they can yeah. so that they can be flexible. Okay, first off, you did that was a but. Not an Ann, <laughs> Dean, Esquire, uh, but 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 I but I I, I, I think you're really onto something, and I, I don't disagree with you. There's a great and you're old Army guy, an old Air Force guy, and they said in the military, educate for what you know. Uh, no, sorry, train for what you know, educate for what you don't know. Train for what you know, educate for what you don't know. Um, we have a great career education office. And um, we do some training at a liberal arts college. We really do, whether it be through internships or um, experiential or other things. We bring very practical skill set to our very august, wonderful liberal arts education where we do three semesters. We're so old school, we do three semesters of Western and global cultures required. But we still make sure guys can crank out on a spreadsheet uh, or what have you, and that they have the internships and the experience to be successful going forward. Here's the deal. It's not, it's not a or B, it's C, both of the above. I think mission-driven organizations that are looking at a particular uh, group of students coming from a certain background, other whatever, a lean institute, whatever, I think you have to be able to do both and try your best not to sacrifice. I'm not saying it's easy or gonna be perfect, but I think that 
I don't think we have a choice in our society other than to do both. Educate and prepare for specific jobs that are, uh, that are available right now. So I, I think that um, we always have done that. And we've gotten a bum rap at this point about um, what we um, have or have not done. And so I don't like to be put into a de defensive posture about that. I really um, do think that experiential learning as a focus is one way of getting out of being defensive because everybody thinks that experiential learning is a good thing, I think, at this point. Uh, and the data confirm that those experiences do help in problem-solving capacity, in staying engaged, and in being a part, of uh, 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 being a good citizen. Uh, so when I'm talking about experiential learning, I'm talking about a host of things at this point. One is internships. We all talked about that. Um, and we used to segment those. But now internships, particularly, um, that go on for more than a semester um, are being supported and discovered, in part because the data also confirm that if you have had an experience in college that was more than a semester and a particular project, that you view your college experience as a positive experience more often than others who haven't. Having a mentor also is connected to internships and other experiential learning opportunities. Uh, we have focused on civic engagement as part of our experiential learning, and so that means that people are in the community and they're working with the community. So historically, public institutions have been anchor institutions. But now, if you talk about civic engagement, what you're really talking about is the collaboration with other partners in the community. And that means that the students get to interact with them, they get the diverse experiences, uh, they get uh, to imagine themselves in a more complex learning environment uh, and then to actually be engaged in problem solving. So those experiential learning. I'm going to add one other. Uh, many schools now have focused on the global learning aspect. For us, we have a uh, very short uh, travel experience. There are immersive courses where you go all over the, the world. You, there are 10 or 12 each year, and people can actually... Um, have a course where they are getting academic credit and then go abroad for two or three weeks during spring break and a, 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 a week or two after that, come back and in your classroom talk about what you've learned. Uh, and uh, those are some ways that um, particularly people who don't have the means to go for a semester can try it, you'll like it, you know, be exposed to some, well, you know, get a passport, understand what it means to be outside of South Jersey or North, North the, the North uh, East Corridor, uh, be a part of a, a world-class university in a different environment. And so those are the things that I think can help um, convince people that this is not uh, fun and games, this is serious. Well, back to your first question is how we convince the other folks. I Basically, uh, my response generally is that we're building a foundation for the future. I don't know what jobs are going to be available 20, 25 years out there. We need to have broad uh, experiences, broad range of experiences, an opportunity for students to really be able to adjust and do whatever they need to do. Um, and uh, that's really kind of what we're doing as institutions in terms of building foundations. One of the things we did at the University of Cincinnati to kind of expand opportunities for students, actually we were in a curriculum revision opportunity because we were changing from quarters to semesters. And the faculty really took this on, and I was really pleased because it wasn't something that I pushed. Uh, it was an opportunity to That's why the faculty took it on. Okay. That's why the faculty took it on. Yeah. Because you didn't push it. Because you push it. <laughs> In every course, they had to have one of three dimensions to it. It either had to be a writing course, had to be a course in which it was a service learning experience, or a course in which there was international experience. And this was throughout the entire university wow. that this had to happen. Um, and I think that was just absolutely amazing. When I was at City College, for instance, what we tried to do, uh, you know, I wanted to have our students have international experiences. Although actually more than half the students at City College were born outside the United States, many of them had never been outside the United States after being, you know, coming to the U.S. when they were kids. Um, and so what 
what the studies do find actually is an international experience can be a short experience, but still absolutely meaningful. Yes. And I remember that I took a group of uh, science students at City College to Vienna, and we spent about four or five days in Vienna at a junior science conference uh, where they had a chance to work with you know, other undergraduate students, some masters, some PhDs. We had students at that conference from more than 40 countries around the world. The connections that were made there uh, really provided an opportunity for them to see that people around the world were working on the same things they were working. It had a tremendous impact on them. Actually, also, there's an opportunity to kind of do these kind of things during uh, interim, you know, between semesters. My wife took a group of 20 City College students, again, half of them been born outside the United States. They spent, you know, four weeks in Morocco living with Moroccan families. And not only were able to enhance their learning of Arabic, but really have an opportunity to live in another culture. These are the kinds of foundations that I'm talking about. This has really impressed with me in, in another way, which also made me an advocate. I had a good friend, uh, Fortune 500 CEO, traditionally would take a group of maybe about 10 CEOs with him to Israel. We'd spend 72 hours there, and we met everybody from the prime minister to the head of the bank. Now, not all the students are going to do those kind of things, but it made it clear to me you can have a meaningful experience in a short period of time in something that will, in fact, stay with you forever. And so we need to experiment with these types of things, particularly in schools where a lot of our students are working, if not part-time, some are working full-time mm -hmm. as well. You want to provide those opportunities and that foundation on which they're going to build their own opportunities in the future. I would love to keep going, but I see that our, our, our time for the panel is up. I do want to let you know that there were other interesting questions that came forward and maybe I could take a little license because one came up that was very interesting and maybe we could just shoot out each one of you very quickly to answer this question. And one of them has to do with diversity. And a member of the audience said, what do the panelists think the Supreme Court is going to do oh, with the yeah. case coming up on affirmative action? And so as I looked at this question, I go, ooh, should I really ask this or not? But it would be interesting to get, if not answering that question, talk about what do we do in order to get all stakeholders to appreciate the dynamic of diversity as a salient part of the educational enterprise? And we'll close with that. We'll just go each one. Mm -hmm. Look out the window read the paper, go on the internet, and tell me, and this is in no way a ding of, of, of President Obama, but think about how we converse about race in 2015. Uh, we still don't have it right. Uh, you can go back and read texts from 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. I look at some of the things that are happening, and we talk about Cincinnati, we talk about uh, uh, Ferguson, you talk about uh, Charleston. And again, this is not the pick on those places, but let's just say that as Lincoln said, the union is not yet perfected. And the only way for folk, and I use that word deliberately, to get to work together in a civil polis is we've got to know each other. You know, the zip code world we live in, where this one zip code gets the SAT prep and this, that, and the other one, and the other one, you know, doesn't get much anything, and they don't even play Little League baseball against no each other. No science teacher. No science teacher. Well, and they, and they, don't, they don't play Little League baseball together each other. They don't, they don't go serve in the military together. We are creating a, a, a chasm in America that is going to be our downfall uh, on so many levels. And I think that if we move away from the promotion of inclusive, inclusiveness, civility, and, and diversity, we're only going to make that chasm grow. So I would give it a philosophical rather than a legal read and say, Lord help us if we don't continue to anoint and bring up and lift up the power of living well together. Two points, yes. Um, I agree with all that has just been said, in part because I so profoundly um, understand more as president and as dean and uh, as a constitutional law professor how highly segregated our lives are. And that cannot continue. Um, it's to our detriment. Everybody knows that. Whether you want to talk about it in terms of 
economic segregation or racial and ethnic segregation, these segregated lives really challenge us to be able to actually continue to be the prosperous nation that we are um, and the, the, the pathbreaker. Um, I fear what is going to happen um, in the Supreme Court, uh, but I also know uh, that um, the tide is changing, at least in commentary that I read. Frank Bruni wrote a, a piece recently oh, in the Times where he really talked about the fact that diversity has real meaning for people who have had that experience in college uh, and that it really does affect the way that you deal with problem solving, but also with your life. Uh, and so for the, a court to be deaf to that is really, would be really problematic. Um, on the other hand, uh, I know that our students benefit from it. Uh, right after Ferguson, we had a meeting in a room that was a little larger than this. 300 students came. We just said, if you want to come talk, come talk about it. 300 students came and they talked very personally about their experiences on a college campus that was diverse, uh, but also the challenges that they have even going home. You know, walking through the campus, having to be informed as black men that they had to carry themselves in a different way and what that means in life. So having all of those students hear those stories is very, very helpful. Um, and we've got to continue to talk about it. Okay. Dr. Well, um, I've spent a lot of time in the last um, decade going around the country talking about race as a result of my book. And there is a great desire to have these discussions mm -hmm. on campus. And I think it's something that we need to do no matter what the Supreme Court does. And I'm not real optimistic about what they're going to do uh, because people do want to talk about uh, race and ways we can, in fact, come together. And I think the university is a great forum and a great place uh, for that to happen. And the universities really oftentimes have shied away from that uh, because of the controversy and because that it can kind of create uh, some tension and making people a little uncomfortable. Um, folks have uh, plugged their schools. I would plug, actually, we're getting ready to make a movie out of my book, uh, yeah. Life on the Color Line, so I'll be, continue to be back on college campuses <laughs> to talk about race in America. <laughs> But, and on that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, would you give a hand to these wonderful panelists?